to you. God be the glory. Amen. For all his wonderful, wonderful acts. And we certainly thank God today for another opportunity right here at City Refuge Christian Center, Church of God in Christ in the city of Enfield, North Carolina. Thank God for a wonderful, wonderful Fourth of July. Yes. Another day of independence. So we ought not to take that lightly. Amen. We ought not to take that lightly at all. Uh, if the devil has his way, we would still be in bonds. Mm -hmm. And if you look if you listen to the wrong people, you will believe that you're in bonds today. Because a lot of them are. But the shackles we are in today is not a bondage that any man imposes on us. The bondage that we are in today is spiritual. The world, the nation is in spiritual bondage. But that is not God's will for his people. Bible says where the spirit of the Lord is there is liberty and I'm thanking God today for liberty the liberty that he has given unto us that even in physical bondage some people in the world even in this nation are in bondage to people but if you are a child of the king, confess unto Jesus Christ as Lord, covered in his blood, God still gives you freedom and liberty, even in bondage. God told Onesimus, who was a slave, told him to render unto his slave master as unto the Lord. And then he commissioned, he commanded the slave owner to treat your bond servant, treat your slave as a free nurse, as a free person under the grace and mercy of God. The times that they were in physical bondage, um, um, bondsmen, bond servants, they were indentured servants, it was, it was a legal thing. People had to work their way out of situations because they had no money to pay. Onesimus was one of those people and the Lord even told him in uh, a situation like his, sometimes to run away was worse than staying especially if the desire was to flee and live. Now, a lot of slaves are willing to flee and die in the process. But the Lord spoke unto Onesimus and said, now if you want to live, because God knows your deliverance is coming. So we don't take our independence lightly. And with the powers that be in government, if a lot of them had their way, our freedom could end at any moment because the vehicle, the truck, the car, whatever, is going down the road. The train is going down the track and nobody is at the wheel. So the fact that we are still secure is a blessing from God. We want to talk tonight We've been talking recently concerning uh, God's desire, God's plan for children. We were talking about 
preaching to the times in which we live. And one of the things that the Lord has placed upon my heart is we struggle today with knowing how to walk in the liberty wherewith you've been made free. Paul told the Galatians to walk in the liberty in which you've been made free and be not again entangled with the yoke of bondage. Walk, therefore, in the liberty where God, have Christ, have set you free and be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. Thank God for our, our church. Thank God for City Refuge and those that are here. Thank God for my precious wife being here. We thank God for all of you that will view the Bible study. This is Bible study. We still preach Jesus, but we preach it in a, a interactive way on Bible study. You have the opportunity, if you're in the sanctuary, to actually interact and if there were questions or comments that 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 are, that, that are, that are desired, because sometimes people sit under teaching or preaching, and they're confused or they don't understand or or or, or they just need a different answer, some kind of answer, and they have no opportunity to ask that question. Well, if you come to Bible study at City Refuge Christian Center, mm -hmm. you have that opportunity. We have an interactive Bible study. So we thank God for our Facebook and our YouTube viewers. Yeah. Thank God for you being a part of our ministry here at City Refuge Christian Center, Church of God in Christ. Let's dive into the Word. Mm -hmm. I hope you had a great 4th of July feast. We've got a feast for you today that is greater than any physical food you will put in your mouth that you would consume. Jesus said, if you eat of this meat, if you eat of my body, he says, you will never hunger again. If you drink of this cup, he said, you will never thirst again. So we want to talk tonight concerning when the Lord has brought us from somewhere. Everybody has been brought from something. Everybody's pedigree is not holiness as far back as they can remember. Some of us have a past. Some of us have things that the Lord has brought us out of. Horrific things. Not just, you know, well, Lord, I wasn't saved when I grew up. Uh, you know, uh, I smoked a joint or a cigarette when I was 14, you know. Or, or, or I, 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 I had, you know, I fornicated one time before I got married. Um, the Lord still needs to cover that in his blood. But then there are others who have come out of greater spiritual bondage. We were all born into iniquity and the Lord has brought us out. But what a lot of believers struggle today, they don't know how to walk in the liberty wherewith they've been set free. And so they are kept in bondage by their past. One of the things we used to say back in the old church that it's a good thing God delivered you us. It's a good thing that God forgave us because people will not. And that is a fact of life. But you still have to understand that God has made provision for you to overcome that. If you truly have been delivered and set free, now that's going to become a, that's the operative term. That is the presupposition. We operate under the presupposition or we presuppose that you have been delivered. Mm -hmm. Before this equation can equal a right answer, first part of the, of the equation is the 
presupposing the presupposition that you have in fact been delivered. Mm -hmm. If you've not been delivered, then you need to seek God's deliverance. The Holy Spirit comes to deliver us. Jesus said, he that began a good thing in us, in us will continue to perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. But if the Lord has delivered you, whether it was last week, last month, last year, 20 years ago, there is somebody that's going to remember you. I'll tell you who the biggest accusers are, rightfully so. I want I, I want to I want to qualify this next statement. Rightfully so, some of your biggest accusers are your family. Amen. Because they see us before we put uh, 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 we wash our face and get the cobweb out of our eyes and, and put our dentures in and, and put on our clean clothes, you know, put our makeup on, you know, fix our hair. The same thing with our behavior. They see our behavior in its naked form. And Jesus said, a man is not without honor anywhere except in his own country. So what the Lord was saying was, sometimes you're going to have to endure the ridicule that you rightfully earn. But the Bible says whom the Lord has set free is free indeed. And we cannot allow past life, past actions. Again, operating under the presupposition that you've been delivered. You can't let that keep you in bondage to the degree that you are not, you are not uh, uh, evangelically effective. You are an ineffective witness. A lot of folks in the church are ineffective witnesses. Not that God has not given them the authority and the power to demonstrate holiness, but they've been defeated in their own mind. And that's what the devil is. Jesus said that the devil is an accuser of the brethren. If you've ever watched any of those exorcist movies from back in the day, well, the first thing, well, we don't have to go through a theory, uh, 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 through a, 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 a worldly example. Let's use a biblical example. When the sons of Sceva went to cast out demons, and they said, we adjure you to come out in the name of the Lord that Paul served. And the first thing the devil did was he said, Ninja, I know you. Mm -hmm. I know Paul. Mm -hmm. He said, Paul, I know. He said, Jesus, I know. But who are you? You, I don't know, it's being washed in the blood. But what the devil was telling him is, I know you, I know your life. The devil, Satan, and his demons, they are not omniscient. They are not all-knowing. They cannot read your mind. They cannot predict your future beyond what God will allow. But they do know what you've done. And they know what you do. To the degree that they will always convict you. By, and they will stifle you. The devil will make you irrelevant by reminding you of who you are. And he never gives you the present tense. Remember now, he's a deceiver. So he's never going to call you delivered. He's always going to call you out for what you did. Because he knows in your mind, you remember. And as humans... If we are not really committed to a relationship, this is why you have to be committed to a relationship. This is one of the duties that the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit comes to 
empower us for worship. He empowers us to have communion with the Father. And so what Satan does, he wants to deny you that communion. You've been forgiven. You've been redeemed. You've been set free from that lifestyle. So whatever you've done in the past that you've asked the Lord for forgiveness for, it now becomes your witness to somebody else that needs that encouragement. But what the devil does to us today is he stifles our ability to be effective witnesses by always reminding you of what you've done. And when you buy into that, you won't ever be an effective witness for Christ because you start to see yourself as a hypocrite not as, a, not as a shining example of God's grace. Not the, the blood that Jesus shed for you. It never loses it, its power. You've been set free. You can now preach to those that are in like condition. And say, I know the Lord will set you free. First, the Bible says he will. Whether you've expressed it or not. But I'm living proof. We have testimonies every day from the uh, lifestyles that are an abomination to God. And how people say, uh, I was in this lifestyle, but the Lord set me free. I would, he, he set Mary Magdalene free. She didn't forget she was a prostitute, but what she remembered more was where God delivered her from. Yeah. And she became an effective witness of deliverance. And that's what people need to see. But you can't run around pretending you've not done it. You proclaim God's power over it. But what people do, they try and run from their past. And in trying to run and hide, nobody sees you. What happens when you run and hide? The whole purpose of running and hiding and so nobody sees you. But the Lord said, that is not the purpose of redemption. That was not the purpose of salvation. That was not the purpose of sanctification. Sanctification was the gift that God's love empowers us with by the blood of Jesus that we can say, now I'm clean. And then we go on to be Effective witnesses. So we want to talk tonight concerning uh, overcoming a dark past. Overcoming a dark past. Preaching to the women. I'm preaching today. I'm teaching today to the times in which we live. You're a hypocrite if you act like it didn't happen. You ain't hypocrite if you preach against it while you're doing it. But you got to remember, God's word is true whether you've been delivered or not. But we're trying to help you today to become an effective witness in the times in which we live. One of the greatest struggles in today's time and what we're watching happen in society. Parents and families feel like they have no influence on their own children, on their own family members, their own siblings. I thank God I was, I had the privilege of preaching the gospel to my stepfather. And in my opinion, he was a much better man than me. But at the time, he had not been washed in the blood as a confessed believer of Jesus Christ and the work that he did on the cross. And because of that, the message of deliverance, the message of salvation, the gospel message is being lost in our own homes around the people we have the greatest opportunity to influence. And then if you won't influence somebody that's sitting beside you, 
you're not going to influence anybody that you come in contact with. Again, the Holy Spirit is not going to let you be a liar in the face of God. So when you feel like you can't minister to your own family members, it makes you, even if you speak, Paul said, I did not come when he went down to Corinth. Speaking with uh, enticing words, but in demonstration of the spirit and in power. If we're going to be effective witnesses, we have to speak with authority and in the power of the spirit. And so you can overcome a dark path. We all have to do it. But then we have to face reality. I know a great pastor who back in his early days, it has been reported to me that he was involved in uh, homosexuality. But God delivered him long before I met him. Because when I met him, he was pastoring. And up until this day, he's a great man of God, great character. How? His past was his past, but we know him now by his walk. He overcame his past where it mattered. You see, some people, it's never going to matter with them. And needless to say, we're trying to teach our children, our communities, our churches, how important a good name is. Matter of fact, that's part two of the Bible study tonight, is keeping the good name that you have. But we also want to empower those who say, you know, I started off on the left foot, not the right. Like I used to say, I was raised in the church, but I wouldn't always say. But God says we need to recognize that we can overcome a dark past because now God has called you. The Bible says whom the Lord did for no, he did predestinate to be conformed into the image of his son. Conformed. He said not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so he told you how difficult it may be difficult. It may be difficult. Such as life. But he said all things work together for good to them who love God. Who are the called according to his purpose. So we want to look tonight, because God gave us great examples of how this thing will manifest itself. David said in Psalms 120, he said, the memory of the righteous is a blessing, but the name of the wicked will rot. I'm going to say that one again. The memory of the righteous is a blessing. But the name of the wicked will rot. Overcoming a dark past. Paul told the Philippians in Philippians 2 and 22. He said, but ye know the proof of him that as a son with his father, he has served me in the gospel. And what Paul was telling the Philippians, he was talking about Timothy. He was talking about some of the folks that were helping him in the ministry in his three missionary journeys. And how a lot of them had overcome some difficulty. Paul being one of the premier ones. Let's go in our Bibles to the book of Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. Let's go to verse 59. Acts chapter 7. Verse 
number 59. Acts chapter number 7. Starting at the last verse, 59. And it says, as they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he, Stephen, kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge, the people that were stoning him. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Verse chapter 8, verse 1. And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So what they were saying, Saul, one of the arguably the greatest apostles in the New Testament, one of them, the apostles, Jesus being the Christ. Separate Jesus. He's in a category all by himself. But Saul, before God saved him, before Jesus saved him on the, on the Damascus road, his name was Saul. And of course, Saul was a well-placed, highly favored, powerful Pharisee who was zealous in that that he did. He understood at that time that he was defending the, uh, the Abrahamic or and the Old Covenant, the Old Testament covenant with God, with all that he had, defending the Old Testament covenant that God had with Israel. And Saul was consenting unto his death. Saul was cheering them on as they stoned Stephen. In verse eight, at, uh, chapter 8, verse 2, And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church. Saul was a vile man. He wasn't that guy that would go out there in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, uh, a demonstration or a rally holding those signs saying, shut them down, shut them down. No, Saul was with that group that was kicking church doors in and kicking house doors in of believing Christians at that time. And he said he went into every house, hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Therefore, they, 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 were, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Now, God used this for his own glory because what it caused the, 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 as far as the Pharisees were concerned, as far as Judaism was concerned, the unintended consequence of their action was that it was God's will. Their aggression against the church is, a, is no different than the aggression that they had imposed on Jesus. Just like Satan thought he was taking Jesus out of the equation when Jesus went voluntarily to the cross, God used the occasion of this episode, of this period of time when the Jews came against the Christians, God used it as an opportunity to disperse them. It's called the diaspora. It is when God dispersed the Christian believers. And by dispersing them, they were sent to different places that were not receiving the word of the Lord, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ at that time. So let's go to chapter 9, verse 1. Now Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter 
against his disciples of the Lord, he went unto the priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. He was going there to directly persecute the church. And I don't mean talk bad about them. He was bringing them up by, the, by, uh, uh, by their necks. He was giving them home. He was putting them in prison. And he enjoyed that because of, he was under the belief that God wanted them dead. And he gained a great reputation doing it. To the degree when Paul showed up anywhere, they recognized him. Uh-oh, that's Saul of Tarsus. That's Saul, the, the, uh, that's Pharisee Saul. That's, that's, uh, and then he was one of Gamaliel's students. And Gamaliel was considered at that time one of the chief uh, 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 theolog theologians. He was a great, uh, uh, he had great depth in the Old Testament scriptures. And he was the greatest, one of the greatest teachers and leaders and mentors in that first century church. And so Paul was not a person that when he came around, you didn't go running out there getting in his face. When you saw Saul and his guys coming, and you gotta, you gotta know now, y'all out there, you've been around the world. If you got, if you're an adult, you've been around society long enough to know when the zealots come, when the LBGTQ crowd, crowd come, they're loud. When Black Lives Matter come, they're loud, and they're they're doing damage. When 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 the uh, um, sons of the Confederate come. When Jim Crow came, when the crew, when the KKK came, they were not just carrying posters. They were knocking you upside your head and, 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 and they were taking names. So this was Paul's reputation at that time. Christians were literally terrified of him because to see Saul coming, Man, you were getting ready to literally die for what you believe. You better believe that Jesus was Savior because like Stephen, you were getting ready to go meet him. And now Paul gets letters from the Sanhedrin to go to Damascus, to the synagogues, where Christians were starting to preach Jesus. You gotta remember now, your first Christian converts, they were Jews. Jesus said he brought salvation to the Jew first, then to the Greek. And so he gets letters from the Sanhedrin, from the chief priests, to go to Damascus because he heard they are preaching down there too. And he goes, but on his way, hey, come on, you son of that ocean. While he was on the way, Acts chapter 9, verse 2 said, he met Jesus. Mm -hmm. And suddenly there shined around him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecuted thou? And he said, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecuted. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, how for you? Now he's getting ready. He know he's been confronted by God. He don't kick and scream and say, no, 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 no. Because when God comes to personally visit you, yes. as he does, what he wants to hear you say is, yes, Lord. That's what Paul did. That's when you know you've been redeemed. Yes. Paul trembles and says in astonishment, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? At this point, Saul still thinks he's doing God's work. And 
And the Lord says to him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told unto thee what thou must do. And the men with, that was journeyed with him stood speechless. They heard the voice. They didn't see anybody. But they heard the words. Paul did not proclaim to be delivered and then told everybody that he had a confrontation with God. No, the people that was with him, just like the people that were standing in the Jordan River when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, and they said a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. There were witnesses to it. There was witnesses to Saul's conversion. The Bible says when Saul rose, verse 8, when his eyes were open, he saw nobody. He saw nobody because he was blind. God took his sight. And he went to Damascus. But I will tell you this, when he got there, he was somebody else. I've been redeemed yes, yes. by the blood of Jesus. I see clearly now. Yes. And the Bible says in chapter 9, verse 10, uh, uh, he went there and the Lord sent him there to see Ananias. And he is blind. And then the Lord goes and tells Ananias, Paul's coming. And he said in verse 11, the Lord said to him, then he told Saul, arise and go into the street which is called Straight. And inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayed. So the Lord sends Ananias to the house where Paul is. And the Lord says to Ananias, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming. This is Saul talking. He, the Lord says, Saul has seen you already, Ananias, in a dream. He knows you're coming. And putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. So Paul, so, so Ananias goes and he says, okay, the Lord said, this is your instruction, Ananias. I want you to go find Saul. Mm -hmm. He's there. He's, he's fasting. He's blind and fasting. Mm -hmm. And when you get there, Ananias, and began to speak with him he said I'm going to drop the scales from his eyes because when his sight comes back this time he's going to be a new man mm -hmm. now watch what Ananias says Acts chapter 9 verse 13 I've heard by many this man how much evil he had done to thy saints at Jerusalem Overcoming a dark pass. Saul earned his pass. He was proud of it. He had a name. And Ananias tells the Lord, he had authority from the chief priest to lock us up. Mm -hmm. To do as he pleases. But then the Lord answers Ananias and says go thy way for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel but I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake there is going to be some sacrifice there's going to be some sacrifice Verse 18 says, immediately after Ananias visits him and lays hands on him, he says, the scales fell off of, of, of Saul's eyes. Saul received the Holy Ghost. The Bible says, verse 18, and then Saul, Saul was strengthened in the Holy Spirit and he stayed there 
and for a few days, and after he went straight to the synagogue at Damascus and began to preach. But we find here two things happen. First, verse 21. Your friends before you got saved, a lot of them will be your enemies after you get saved. Because you've been changed. They have. And just because you say you've been changed, doesn't mean they're going to receive it. Last time I seen that guy, he was standing on the corner selling crap. Now he's walking around with a clergy collar on. Who is he fooling? Now I remember I was listening to an interview recently and uh, I guess Puck Daddy and, and, and Mace who started out this business partners and friends together, I guess they're enemies now. And uh, one of the things that, that, that Puck said about Mace, he said he was running around here with me hanging out, partying, every day and night, fornicating, doing drugs, you know, wheeling and dealing. Now he walking around with a clergy collar on, you know, uh, uh, tricking people in the church. Who is he fooling? He had a dark past. But the Lord said to him, you, you belong to me now. So now, Paul is in a particular situation here that's sort of tricky. And the situation that Paul is now in is the people he ran with before he got saved, he readily denounced them. But what he is about to find out, they received him well in Damascus. Why? Because they were in Jerusalem, where people had direct knowledge of who Paul is. You're going to come in contact again after you get saved with those people you ran with before you got saved. And the world is too small for you to get away from them. Because I don't care where you go, somebody from your past is going to come back to visit you. And the Lord is saying, don't run, duck, and hide. Be prepared for it. And Paul spent a great time in his preaching recognizing that there was a price for carrying the bloodstained banner. So Paul is preaching mightily in Damascus. Paul is preaching mightily but then we find here when Paul decides, God led Paul back into the lion's den. After Paul finished his training with Ananias in Damascus, he turns around and he goes back to Jerusalem. So when he gets there, He's got two problems. The Jews now hate him because he's actually become the very enemy that they're fighting against, that he was one of the chief partners they had. Now he comes back carrying the cross of Christ, speaking against their authoritarian rule, and Paul says, I'm okay with that. But Paul realized there was great danger in that position because he was with these guys. They were killers. They planned to kill Paul. The other side of that problem was the very Christians he is now representing in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria, they don't trust him. They still think he's undercover. He's infiltrating 
the Christian body now. He didn't come here with a pure heart. He come in, that's it right here. He's coming to set us up. And it got so bad when the Jews started, when they, they took counsel against him. In verse 23. Verse 24. They laid a, a trap for Paul, for Saul. And they watched for him. Because when they found out he was back in Jerusalem, he went back there and realized, I can't preach here. He couldn't preach in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria. Why? He had a dark past. And I'm not talking about from a year ago or two years ago. No Paul got converted and went back to Jerusalem within two weeks. And so now he's trying to preach to people that don't want to be nowhere around him. And he's got the Jews trying to kill him. We find in verse 25 of chapter 9 in the book of Acts, the disciples had to take him down in a basket at night and uh, Barnabas and another few of the other disciples, they had to get him out of town. And he had to go back to Damascus. So what the Lord did with Paul, so he converts him, says, I'm going to change your name. Your name is now Saul, Paul. And God says, I need you, Paul, to go preach the gospel to the Gentiles. The Jews rejected Paul. The same Jews Paul would have to deal with all through the New Testament. Time after time after time. Because of Paul's bad name, the disciples would, would, would reject Paul. Paul had to go back in all three of his missionary journeys. Wherever he went, he had to deal with Jews, Jewish converts to Christianity, that were in Asia, they said, we know you. Everywhere Paul went, Paul would start his, 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 his books. Whenever you see the books that Paul wrote, in many of them, he wrote, especially in Corinth, Corinthians, and in Galatians, Philippians, Paul had to start out qualifying himself as an apostle. Because people were like, we know you. A bad name is what David said. He said, the memory of the righteous, the memory of the righteous is a blessing, but the name of the wicked will rot. So we have to remember that. When you are a redeemed witness for the Lord, you're going to have to deal with the reality that you had a past. And some of it dark. But you have to be willing to endure that. I say often in some of the mishaps in my life, and the Lord delivered me. He saved me. But I'll be the first to admit, everybody's not going to accept your deliverance just because you said it. So you're going to have to weather that storm. The Bible says the accusers are going to come. Your job is to make sure that the accusations are not current and not still true. Yes, Paul said I was a murderer. Throughout Paul's three missionary journeys, all the churches that he planted, all the ministries that he helped build up, Paul told him, Yes, I was a sinner. I was the chief sinner. Matter of fact, I killed Christians. But I've been redeemed. And his life that he lived demonstrated that he'd been redeemed. People are going to not believe it. Some folks are going to, this one pastor I was talking about, if you've seen a few people that he know even today, I met the man 30 years ago. So whatever his lifestyle was, it was beyond that. But even today, I know at least one person 
that if his name came up and you didn't know him, somewhere during that conversation, they're going to say, you know he was homosexual back in the day. Some people are never going to let your past go. But Paul, God showed Paul, you got to push on. Paul, the Lord gave Paul a new vineyard to preach in. But you may not have the advantage Paul had of being able to. Paul didn't have a family, so Paul was free to move about and go wherever he wanted to. You might have to stay right there in the, in the bed that you made. You had a bad relationship with your wife and your children. You separated, you got back together, you're there now. You're going to have to earn the new name. And we're going to talk about how to do it. But the one thing you have to keep in mind, no matter what they say, I've been redeemed. And God will give you a new mindset to understand. See, you got preachers out here and, and, and people teaching. Jesus said that if you have an alt with somebody, then pray, leave your gift. If you, got, if you got a gift, come to the altar, leave your gift, and then go back and get it right. And, and that's your requirement to God. That may or may not satisfy the person you offended. When you go and tell that person, I did you wrong and I just want your forgiveness. Don't be surprised if that person says, I don't accept your apology. I don't want your apology. I hope you rot in hell. So you crumple up, go in your living room, watch church service on TV, and you never try to be an effective minister for Christ. You have stifled your walk. You are not productive for the Lord anymore because you refuse to walk in the liberty wherewith you have been made free. The Lord sets you free to demonstrate you are the shining of the glory, the grace, the mercy, the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. And your past helps you be a more effective person. My bishop says all the time, Bishop William, if you've done something in the past that was wrong, and you've asked the Lord to forgive you, you've been washed in the blood. That don't mean if I'm standing out there and I'm, I'm in front of an abortion clinic and I'm ministering and witnessing, trying to keep young women from having abortions and, and maybe I've been a part of one. So the devil said, who are you to be out here telling them that? You had a wife or girlfriend that did it. But the Lord is saying, the devil is a liar. Because God delivered you, you become the greatest witness of all that God will deliver and God will keep you. And just because I did it, doesn't mean I still believe it. Don't you understand the definition of justification? It's just as if I would not done it. That's what justification is. That's what being washed in the blood is. The Lord says, I will throw your sins into the sea of forgetfulness. I will remember your sins no more. God has the ability to do that because he's omnipotent. People do not. Now, let's talk reality. You break in my house. I invite you in my house. And then you steal something out of my house. I find out. I forgive you. But I'm an idiot. Don't be surprised you come back to visit me the next time. Should I let you in? I may say, okay, well, we're going to sit here in the living room this time and we won't be out of each other's eyesight. Or I forgave you. But I'm not letting you back in my house again. That is a perfectly normal response by some people. We're going to look at another example of that. We find in the book of Genesis. We talk about Joseph and his brothers. Joseph was about 17. He brought his father a bad report. Y'all know the story. On his 
brothers, Genesis chapter 37, and the brothers became jealous. They plotted one day to throw him in a pit, and let a wild beast kill him, and then tell his father, no, and kill him, and tell the go tell their fathers if that wasn't enough, they were going to go lie to their father and tell the father that a wild beast ate him. But then, uh, after they done the deed, threw him in the pit, they then decided uh, not to leave him in the pit to die. Uh, but they would, so they, he's in the pit, and uh, Reuben decides, you know what, uh, maybe we, we shouldn't leave him in the pit to die. So he sees a band of Midianites on their way to Egypt to sell goods. He says, how about we, we take him out the pit, sell him, to the Midianites, uh, the Ishmaelites. And they do that. And they take him into Egypt. Upon going to Egypt, he was sold to Potiphar. And of course, Potiphar was the captain of the Egyptian army. God bless Joseph. He grew in influence and, and prominence until Potiphar put Joseph uh, over his whole house. Then, of course, Potiphar's wife tries to seduce Joseph. And Joseph flees the situation, but then she accuses Joseph of trying to take her by force. That winds up with Joseph going to prison. But the Lord was with Joseph. Pharaoh then, you know, after Joseph has a dream and situations that happened in prison, and, and uh, one of the men that was in prison with him, uh, Joseph uh, told them, when you get out, remember me. The, 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 the Pharaoh has a dream, and, and of course, the baker, one of the guys tell him that, hey, tells uh, Pharaoh, I knew a guy that was in jail with me, a, a Hebrew. And, and he had the gift of discerning dreams. And so they bring him out. He discerns the dream, Pharaoh turns around, makes him the ruler over his whole house. And then he also tells Pharaoh as part of the dream that a drought is coming. You've got a drought coming. So during this drought, the drought affects Joseph's, uh, of Jacob's family, who's Joseph's father. They think Joseph is dead. And so during the famine, the brothers that were involved, they are tasked with going to Egypt to try and buy grain. And of course, when they get there, they encounter Joseph, who they don't recognize. But Joseph recognized them. Now, of course, at the end of the day, when Joseph reveals himself to the brothers, they are now terrified. Why? They've done a dastardly thing. They indirectly were, they were directly responsible if Joseph had died. They were responsible. But you see, no matter what the enemy tries to do to you, God had a plan for Joseph. Now, the big thing was when Joseph reveals himself to them, and they already know now how powerful Joseph is. They know Joseph has the authority and the influence to have them killed, all of them, right there on the spot. Joseph even puts them in a position to say, now y'all go back and tell, after he revealed who he was, you go back and tell the father, I'm still alive. But I'm going to keep the youngest brother here. There again, they knew that Jacob was not going to be satisfied with that outcome. But as this story goes, Joseph, after he talks to them and sees his father, he forgives them. But now, they're living in terror now. Because they realize that the only reason they're alive 
is because their father is still living. And they know because Jacob made Joseph promise not to kill them while he was alive. He made that promise. Joseph has already forgiven them. But now they've got a name that they have now have to overcome. But it is a situation that demonstrates the grace of God, one, and that God keeps his promise. You see, Sometimes you can do some jacked up stuff. But don't you know that God of heaven already knows, help me somebody, that you're going to repent down the road? God called you into being. He knew you before he formed you in the womb. If the Lord saved you, he has purpose for you. Don't let anybody zap you out of your purpose for the Lord. Don't let people make you ineffective. But make sure you've been delivered. And if you haven't, spend some time on the altar. Spend some time in God's word. Get in God's favor. God will do you just like he did Mary Magdalene. He will help you. To be a new person because he can make you brand new. Not only that, it was Mary Magdalene that the Lord approached first to demonstrate to her that she had favor with God. God is doing things in your life, even right now, that demonstrates to you that of all the messed up stuff you've done in your past, God still loves you enough and he wants to get the glory out of your life had God killed Joseph's brothers oh help me somebody there would be no 12 tribes God promised Jacob Israel that he would bless his sons 12 of them not 11 not one not just Joseph their blessing came not of their own accord but because of the blessing God made uh, and the promise God made to their father, we're living on somebody else's prayer. Somebody prayed for me, had me on their mind, took the time to pray for me. God made a promise. And when God has purpose for your life, he will preserve you. Not that you become ineffective and guilt-ridden. You've been redeemed. You were pedophile. God redeemed you. Man, your mission ought to be to demonstrate that God can deliver and never be anywhere near that again. You've got to proclaim it from the rooftop, the rooftop that Jesus saved. But don't get discouraged or be surprised if nobody will willingly let you work with children. You earn that suspicion. You earn that criticism. It may be with you for the rest of your life. But being a child of God is one of the uh, uh, is one of the affiliations in this world. Being in the family of God is one of those memberships where you can overcome. You have to defeat good, uh, evil, with good. Are y'all still with me now? God teaches us that no matter what, God is not a liar. God is not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent. The Lord said if you confess the Lord Jesus as your Savior, then you shall be saved. Jesus says all that the Father has given me have I kept and none have I lost. Say the son of perdition, which was Judas. And even in the case of Judas, he, he used what Judas would do. God didn't make Judas betray Jesus. When the devil entered Judas, the Lord told him, go quickly. The Bible says the devil entered him and he went and sold Jesus out. But Judas had it in his heart to do it. So the 
Lord says, if you got it in your heart to do wickedness, God will let you go your way. Judas did it in a moment of weakness. That's how we're going to get to our part two here. That's going to be our segue. Judas betrayed Jesus in a moment of weakness. He said, how do you know? Judas was not a reprobate because he repented too late. Judas killed himself. He didn't repent. He was sorrowful for what he did. That is a textbook example of him not being turned over to a reprobate mind. Judas knew he did wrong. He knew he did wrong. But he did not repent. So even though you've done something wrong, Jesus gives us room to repent. And then he takes our weakness. He takes our feebleness. He takes our uncertainty. He takes our blindness. He takes our, our feeling of insecurity. And he emboldens us by, the, by his spirit. And it makes us whole. Puts us in a position where we can live a redeemed life. So what God did, he provided for the brothers. Through Joseph. That changed their lives. Because Joseph, because Jacob died. Now when Jacob is dead, they believe without a doubt that Joseph is coming back to get them. Joseph has done moved on in the Lord. A lot of times you're sitting around worrying about the people that you are concerned are going to rebuke you for what you've done and they ain't thinking about you. And even if they are, oftentimes they are not in a position that they can deter you. You can let them distract you. But the Bible says, no weapon formed against me shall prosper because now I'm in the employ of the Lord. And, and Joseph, had, they had done great harm to Joseph. We're talking about overcoming a bad past. But once they realized God is good to us, we'll accept whatever Joseph does. But praise be to God. Joseph could have killed him. They would have accepted that. But God had another plan for them. God has another plan for you. Come out of your stupor. Bible said, if you steal, steal no more. Amen. If you cheat, cheat no more. If you sin, repent. But the more you want to please Jesus, the better off you'll be. God tells us when we've been redeemed. First thing he says in Matthew 6 and 33, he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And he says, all these other things will be added. If you're seeking God first, you're not going to be distracted to the point of ineffectiveness. You're not producing. Because you're concerned about the things you can't control. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. And you've got to remember what Jesus was talking about. He told them to uh, uh, take no concern for their life. What they should eat, what they should drink, nor for your body. Then he begins to describe to them how God feeds the fowl of the air that neither sow nor reap. And he says, by what are you worrying for? If God feeds the birds and the fowls of the air, will he not feed you? Then he says, take no thought of concern about it. He says, you can't add one cubic to your side. By worry. You can sit there and worry about what they say about you for the rest of your life. 
You cannot change anybody's mind. God changes people's hearts, people's mind. The people wanted to condemn Paul for his past character. But Paul kept on marching in the name of the Lord, doing good. Are y'all with me? To the degree your actions will speak for you. The Lord said, take no thought for tomorrow. Tomorrow shall take thought of the things of itself. He said, sufficient to the day is the evil thereof. I'm not worrying about what the naysayers are saying. If I've been delivered and I'm not doing it, I've repented and you're not doing it anymore. God will use you. You may never ever get rid of all of your the naysayers or your enemies. But what people will do, they will say, huh, I don't, you know, you know so and so. He was a scoundrel. And they'll be like, huh, I didn't know him that way. I know him to be a man of the Lord. He's humble. He's always looking to help somebody. And the naysayers may still say, yeah, you just wait. You don't know him. You don't know him. But you know what? You let him keep waiting. Because when the Lord takes you out of here, you're going to still be doing good. Why? The Lord says, because you have to remember what you've done. When God delivers you, you've been delivered. When God forgives you, you've been forgiven. But people may never forgive you. But the Lord says, here are some things you want to remember to overcoming a bad past. First Corinthians 4, 2. Moreover, I wish there were some people here tonight that I want to tell this to. In 1 Corinthians 4, 2. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. It is required in stewards of the Lord. Servants of God. God appoints you a lot of times to human oversight. You remember somebody's church? You say the Lord sent you there? I'm a member of North Carolina 3rd. I say the Lord sent me there. That means Bishop Patrick Lane Wooden Sr. is my pastor. The Bible says... Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. If you stay faithful, you will shut the naysayers up. How are you going to say you're born again and delivered? Fighting for the Lord, you'll never go to church. They'll never see you involved in ministry. You're certainly not out there on the street corner preaching. So where is the demonstration that you've been redeemed? Even in your own home. These are the people that really know you. You want to impress my children and you say you love Jesus and you'll never go to church. Nobody hearing that. If God has been so good to you, Dad, why you're not in church? Man, when I can't go nowhere else, I'm going to church. Two, Paul told the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 4 11, and watch this here. Here's how you get beyond the naysayers. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11, and that ye study to be quiet. Sometimes you got to get somewhere. Get your act together. You got to be involved. You got to be committed in your heart and soul to the Lord. You can't think this thing called holiness. It will find you out. Jesus said what you do in the dark will come to the light. If you phony, people are going to know it. You say you love the Lord, you still cussing. You say you love the Lord, you still drinking. You say you love the Lord, you got a wife and a girlfriend. You say you love the Lord, but you're still involved in homosexuality, running around saying, well, you know, the Lord is going to deliver me. Okay, well, until he do, sit your hiding down and embrace God's deliverance and get delivered. Then you will become effective. Otherwise, you will remain, listen to what I'm saying, you will remain the devil's tool because he is going to keep you bound. Jesus said the devil is the accuser of the brethren. 
The Lord asked Satan on the day that the angels came to report to him. During that season in the book of Job. He said, Satan, what are you doing? He said, Lord, I'm going to and fro, in and out, in the earth. Trying to find somebody I can destroy. Trying to find somebody I can accuse. I'm looking. I'm looking. I know they're out there. You think Job, he said, well, have you tried Job? Man, you think, he said, Lord, you think Job is some guy. You think he's your highly anointed. But the only reason Job served you is because you give him everything he wants. And God will make a witness out of you. He made a witness out of Job. God can restore whatever you've lost. The prophet said in 2 Chronicles, I mean in Joel chapter 2, I will restore the years that the locusts have eaten. The canker worm, the pommel worm, and the caterpillar. My great army that I sent among you because your life was sinful. But when you are forgiven and repent and deliver, God said what you need to do before you can run out and start calling yourself a witness that you study to be quiet, to do your own business, to work with your own hands as we commanded you he said, why? First of all, people are going to be observing you. My wife says it all the time, first lady. She said, Christian, some Christians won't go out and witness because they know they jacked up and people know it. So they ain't going, if you if you still jacked up and you sitting in church every week and you're not living nothing, people know it. And you ain't bold enough to go out there and try to convince them because you don't want nobody to confront you. You out there running around with the folks that's Going door to door. Evangelize. They come to they come to visit the church. And they see you sitting up in the pulpit. I remember one time when I had retired from the VA and then we the Lord called us to go to NC Third. And and one of the saints that that um, I didn't know she was a Christian. Well, I had went back to the VA one day, one night my visit. She said, Best ready. I didn't know you was a part of um, North Carolina Third. I said, yeah. She said, yeah, I seen you on TV sitting in uh, at upper room with Bishop Wood. Now, if your name ain't right, and this woman was a member of upper room, she could have got on that phone and said, Bishop, Pastor Reddick is one of your pastors. I knew him at the VA. He was a whoremonger. I used to watch him walking around all the time doing this. I had a young man call, call contact us. Um, uh, and of course, we don't ever know who's going to see us. And we brought up the name of one of our friends who was a pastor. And the, and the first thing the man said is, he a pastor? Really? See, this guy is almost as jacked up as they come. Overcoming a dark past. You have to demonstrate you are now walking in the light. When I dropped the ball in my life, I never walked around believing that everybody was going to believe me just because I said so. But I'm going to give you these quick steps on how you can overcome that. Paul told Timothy, 2 Timothy 2, Therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Jesus Christ, and the things that thou hast heard among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also, watch this, that therefore endure hardness as a good soldier. You're going to have to endure it. Paul had to endure it. They ran Paul out of Jerusalem. They got Paul to his dying day. Some of the naysayers said, they still did not want to believe he'd been converted. Paul done started more churches than anybody in the first century. Christianity. Paul says lastly in Romans 12 and 18. He said, if it be possible, overcoming a dark past, if it be possible, 
as much as lies in you, live peaceably with all men. That is a demonstration that you've been redeemed. It will help you to get beyond a dark past. Don't do the stuff no more you used to do. And you don't have to be dogmatic about it. Oh, oh, I remember you used to hang out with us. Now you want to come out here and preach. Then you see them in some area wrong. Or they confront you wrong. Sometimes people will confront you because they knew you were a brawler. And they get in your face. They dog your name. Talk about you behind your back to your face. Because it's the devil dealing with you. It's not the human being upset with you. It's Satan upset with the fact that you've been redeemed. He wants to prove to God, just like he did with Job, that you phony. He said, but rather live peaceably with all men as much as you can. Now, I ain't tell you to be nobody's garbage can. My pastor used to say, Lord, don't expect you to be nobody's garbage, spiritual garbage can. But we know how to live peace. Sometimes you live peaceably with people with just leaving them alone. He said, therefore, beloved, avenge not yourselves. Sometimes you just got to let the naysayers talk. You can prove your life better than you can try and convince somebody with your mouth. He said, therefore, that enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirsts, give him drink. For in doing so, thou shalt heap hot coals of fire upon his head. Do not overcome. He said, to overcome, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Does that sound good, y'all? Now, let's put you on the offense. I was telling some folks in the Church Alliance group I work with, I was talking about, they were talking about, again, we're talking about naysayers. And I said to them, one of the worst things you can do in ministry or in life is spend all your time on defense. If you spend all your time on defense, we've got about five minutes left. If you spend all your time on defense, you will still lose the game because you've not scored any points either. God has given us a divine offense. We have to move forward and be productive in the Lord. So, rather than sitting around all the time trying to figure out what you're doing wrong, use your time in communion with God doing what's right. The defense will take care of itself. The Lord says, I will not leave you or forsake you. But if you spend all your time trying to prove people wrong, you're never going to get nothing done. Let's look at that. On the handouts I gave you, seven ways. We just finished talking about overcoming a bad path. If you overcome it, let's talk about Something that will help you to overcome a bad past. And what is that, preacher? Keeping a good name. Solomon, the preacher, wrote in Ecclesiastes 7 and 1, he said, a good name is better than precious ointment and the day of death than the day of one's birth. If you leave here with a good name in God's sight, you, you've arrived. You've arrived. I don't care. Normally, when you're born, you've done nothing wrong physically. You were born in iniquity. All the bad stuff you're going to do is going to be done from the day, from the time you come into the age of accountability until you die. But Solomon said, of a good name on the day you die. It's better than your name was the day you were born. He also wrote in Proverbs 22 and 1. A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor rather than silver and gold. My, 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 my pastor, Bishop, talks about it all the time. My dearly beloved 
uh, of Pastor Lansing B. McLean that's going on to be with the Lord. Um, they say it, they used to tell us, they tell us every day. He told us every day before going to be with the Lord. He said, keep your name clean. So, number one, keeping a good name. Watch this. This is important, y'all. The first rule in keeping a good name, don't do it for the sake of keeping a good name. This might seem contrary to what you might think. But I believe this to be true. If you set out for the sole purpose of developing a good name for yourself, you might succeed, but it is more likely that this will backfire. I don't want a good name for the purpose of having a good name. Why? Number two. Let's go back there. First of all, the best way to gain a good name is just begin to do the right thing. Just do what's right. And I'm going to explain why I said earlier that don't do it just for the name. He said do it because it's the right thing to do. And why would he say that? If you set out for the sole purpose of just having a, a good name, you find yourself doing stuff because you think people are watching. Now you got to stay with me here. Because, right, I don't want to make what I'm going to say is number two be contradictory. You do, he said, don't do it for the sake of the name. Best way to gain a good name is just to begin to do the right thing. Do it because it's the right thing to do. Not because you believe somebody's watching. Every time you have the opportunity... Just do what God leads you to do. One of the ways you're going to know where how God will lead you, you got to read your word. Have communion with God. Fellowship with the saints. I get encouraged by being around people that like doing stuff right. My pastor taught us to stay near the fire. If the Bible says that bad communication corrupts good manners, if you hang out with bad folks, if you hang out with people that don't know the Lord, you're going to develop some of that conversation. The hard part is this takes time. But you got time. Because we're living our life for the Lord. Paul said, run the race with patience. Stay tuned to faith. Number two. First, number one, don't do it for the name. Two, Always be aware that others are watching. Now remember, I just said in number one, the best way to gain a good name is just begin doing the right thing. Do it because it is the right thing, not because people are watching. But number two, it may seem to contradict number one, but it really does not. This is not about doing the right thing just because somebody is watching. The idea is more about a consistent awareness that you are on stage. People are watching you. I'm talking to the believer, to the Christian. I'm talking to the Christian. We're talking about overcoming a dark past. Now we're talking to those that have a, that are, have overcome the dark past, trying to overcome the dark past. Those that have a good name, how to keep it. You ought to be more focused on keeping a good name than overcoming a dark past. The focus is stop being on the defense, trying to impress people. The problem with trying to impress people, you only do it when you think they're watching. Number two says, you may not know they're watching, but somebody's always watching. The idea is more about a consistent awareness that somebody is watching you. 
So you're living a lifestyle of doing right, maintaining your name, not only trying to do it when you think somebody is watching. When you associate, when you associate your good name, with the name of Jesus, people will begin to watch you because they want to know if your walk is consistent with your talk. Some are hoping that you fail, while others are secretly, are secretly pulling for you. Either way, you need to know their eyes are on you even when you're not aware of it. Don't slip up, you're not alone. Number three. Keeping a good name. Make decisions ahead of time. People say, what do you mean? Paul wrote to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 10 5. He said, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into subjection every thought to the obedience of Christ. Paul said to be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might know what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So my mother and father taught me to make decisions ahead of time. Before I found myself in a tempting situation, you ought to already have made up your mind what you will do. Something come up. You got to pay for something. They'll accept checks. You got checks. But you know you don't got no money in the bank. It should never occur to you to write a bad check. I'm trying to help somebody. If your mind is on holiness, you're going to always say, what would Jesus do? What is the right thing to do? So when, if your mind is made up, I'm going to follow Jesus. Then no matter what comes up, your mind is made up. Money will make you turn your back on God. Because the lack of it will put you in some pretty precarious situations. One of the, two of the greatest things that deceive the, the, the Christian, money and lust. Including women. You playing around with fancy looking gorgeous men and women in your mind. Then when it approaches you, now you're struggling. But you ought to already have your mind made up. I love Jesus and I love my wife. So that is out of the conversation. When it comes down to money, one thing my bishop says. He said, nobody got their hands in my pocket. When you learn to do what's right. When things come up, you are not struggling with the right, with what to do, because your mind is made up before the situation arrives. Make decisions ahead of time. Number four, remember the why. It is almost certain there will be times when you are tempted. The devil is good at his job, and he and you cannot anticipate every possibility of how the devil will tempt you in these situations. That's when he will trip you up. When you stop to think about what you're going to do, just remember why you do it. What is the why? The why is I am committed to Jesus Christ. My association is with Jesus. I don't want to give my relationship with Jesus a bad name. I don't want to give City of Refuge a bad name. I don't want to give the ministry a bad name. I don't want to give my family to have to deal with a bad name. Remember the why. I stand with Jesus. Stand with Jesus. To be seen and heard of men. We do it because we love Jesus. Remember the why. My pastor said, I ain't going to hell for no hot dog. Over no hot dog. If you got to go to hell, he said, man, let me go with a steak dinner. Remember the why. You got to talk loud now. I think what happens is instead of, I think first of all it comes with um, 
name. But in the Lord, it's even greater because yes. we're talking about eternal life. Yes. And a lot of times, Christians struggle on what to do. These Bible study lessons are designed. It's, it's called the Bible in practice. Mm -hmm. The Bible is a, is, a, it is a applied word, which means uh, faith without works is dead. My faith ought to drive me to produce works that please God. And I'm working for a higher prize yes. than just an earthly good name. Right. But if I'm seeking Jesus first, my good name will come with it. Mm -hmm. That was my point about being on the offense as opposed to living your life on the defense. Instead of just sitting around trying to not do anything wrong, focus on just doing what's right. Remember the why. Why we do it. Because we are trying to get to glory when we leave this world. And we want to leave the example of the power of God in a changed life. Number five. This is a big one. This is where folks get in trouble. Unintentionally sometimes. Rule number five. Under promise and then over deliver. A lot of times as Christians, like the wife is just saying, your word is your bond. You don't ever want to be that person that is known for not being a person of their word. I mean, we got folks like that in the church. You really can't ever depend on anything they say. Because they want to appear to be sound and willing and on the team. But when it comes down time to produce, all people will promise you Mars when they can only, they will promise you a thousand yards when they, when, when at their best, they can only give you ten. So here, it's often tempting in situations to promise the world whether you are able to sell something or just estimating you can come up short. The best thing to do is overpromise is a common mistake. It is damaging to a good name. Instead, make your practice to underpromise. Give yourself some cushion. Look, I'll get it done for you in three or four days. And then if you do it tomorrow, they're going to say, great, you've overachieved. Can you give us two days in the revival to help us out? I don't know if I can give you two days, but, you know, I can give you one. Then you give them the two. You know, if you do that, you give yourself a cushion. Back off the touch on the promised performance of your product. Hey, don't worry. It will be flawless. No, I will do the best that I can. Then when you come in ahead of schedule, when you go far and beyond, you met their expectation, you kept your word, everybody wins. Somebody come to you. Well, you know, uh, 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 you can pass them in a little vine here and uh, came up short. You know, I need $500. I'll pay you back the very next day. This is happening. I'll pay you back the very next day. And I get a call and they say, so-and-so promised they was going to let me $500, which was theirs to lend. They could have said no. The person depended on that. The next day come, the recipient is no longer trying to get the $500 because this person promised them they would. Then when it came down to give it to them, they said, oh, I'm sorry, I only got three. Cause the person to be in the dark. Well, if you didn't know, if you knew, you may not come. You knew you had three. You didn't know you got five. How about I promise you two and then it be me, I give you the five.
We overpromise and then we underperform. And if you're going to err, number six, if you're going to err, err on the side of doing right. Many times, there are times when the right thing to do is not black and white. People like to say, we live in a black and white world. No, the reality of it is, grace causes us to live a lot of times in a gray area. No. It's not exactly clear how far you should go in making something right. Well, and, 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 and even, you don't say nothing, you have people and, well, and, and, and not, not to cut you off, but an even better example, you may be involved in some business transaction, and you, you, there come a situation where something goes wrong, and you're both locked in monetarily, and they were trying to help you. And you're saying, well, the thing cost $100, but you only really gave me some of it. So I only really owe you $100. But because the person was really willing to get involved with you in the beginning, they didn't have to get involved with you at all. Then something goes wrong. And you say, well, uh, now, should I just give them what I had pledged to give them? Or if they were helping me and they wound up losing, I have the ability to compensate their loss. What should I do? I'm not quite sure. Well, what God is saying, if you got to err, err on the side of doing what's right. Look, I'm going to go beyond what my commitment is because I don't want you to feel at all that you've been slighted because I may need you again. And the next time you was like, you know, last time I missed with that, with that guy, I lost money. And like even in the church, people will say, you know, look, are we going to do this? We're going to do that. Your pastor may come and ask you to help or do something. And then you jump right out the box and you say yes. When you know there's a possibility, a great possibility that you're not going to do it. So, you know, if you can't do it, just come out and say you can't do it. Then you, you will make a commitment to people and you will tell them you can't after they have no, of no, no option to replace whatever it is you were going to do. If they needed somebody to, you know, come and open up the church, and you say, okay, I'll do it. And, and then, of course, you wind up not coming. They don't find out to the morning of. Now, there's nothing they can do to repair that. But, but if you were going to err, Air on the side of doing the right thing. Hey, I don't know that I can make it. I will do it. I will make it if I can. You know, hey, you lent me your car. Your car had a flat tire. Your car 
broke down or whatever, and and it costs you, you know, this amount of money to get it fixed. The right thing for me to do is to cover as much of the cost as I can. You know, hey, so maybe it costs me two or three dollars, two or three hundred dollars to fix it. And then you might say, well, the thing was broke when you gave me the car. And you knew the tire was going flat. So when the tire went flat, it just so happened I was driving the car when it went flat. Well, because you let me use the car, I'm going to replace the tire. And if you come back and say, you didn't have to do that. Look, here, here's the money back. I'll take care of it. But you gain the respect of a good name because you did what was right. If you have to err, err on the side of doing what's right. Number one, Paul said, number seven, and we're done. Paul said, Hebrews 10 and 25, forsaking not the assembling of ourselves together in the manner as some is, some do, but admonishing one another and so much the more as we see the day approaching. Number seven, endless accountability. Watch the blind spots. When I meet people, I tell them right away, I'm a preacher, I'm a gospel preacher of Jesus Christ. I've been married 42 years. Accountability. Now people are going to say, and you're supposed to be a preacher. It helps me to be accountable. It helps you in areas when you enlist accountability. Because I was telling one of the saints just yesterday. Nobody can grow without accountability. We all are accountable to somebody. At a minimum, we're all accountable to God. Whether you're saved or not, you're accountable to God. And I was saying to this person, you have to, if you expect to grow, if you expect to keep your good name, if you expect to overcome your dark past, you have to put yourself in an environment where you are held accountable. Organizations now, they build their organizations around accountability. There are checks and balances. Why? To keep us accountable. Not by constraint, but voluntarily. I want to be accountable. We have to want to be accountable. I mean, there should not be no eight, nine, ten hours of the day and your family don't know where you are. There should not be situations where uh, uh, uh uh, you have all kinds of people calling your house and these things are clearly not business related. Enlisting accountability. I got on a wedding band. I'm married. Don't be asking me. You know, we're not getting ready to exchange no, no phone number. You know, young lady, you sure look like, man, you look like a you are out on a scale of one to ten, first lady. You are fifteen. Now let's say I don't know you, and I'd be like, you know, hey, where are you there? And I'm gonna tell you what first lady gonna say. With my husband, I'm forty two years. And five kids. Five kids. And grandkids. Nine grandkids and one great grand. That's where I live. And you can't afford all. You know. Oh, man, you sure look young. Oh no. Like she said today, oh no, uh, 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 I've been married 42 years. Matter of fact, that come my husband right there. We have to enlist accountability. I'm done now. I hope the Lord has blessed us. Certainly blessed me. Overcoming a dark past. Keeping a good name. To God be the glory. I want to pray for somebody tonight. Lord, I believe that somebody under the sound of my voice uh, needs healing. Need to come to a place of accepting that you've redeemed them. Lord, 
they've given their life to you. But they're still unsure on the inside. They have no confirmation of relationship with you. And Lord, I'm praying that you can touch their heart right now. That God, you will manifest yourself in their life. That they know that they belong to you. You've received them. That they might be healed from the inner demon that is trying to take their joy. The joy that you've given them. Lord, we are praying right now that you will manifest your might. Yes. That their lives will, that the chain and the bond will be broken. Yes. They will begin to walk in victory. Yes, Lord. And Lord, that you will get the glory out of their life. And Lord, they're going to be champions yes. of your truth. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. God, if there's any under the sound of my voice that don't know you in the party of their sins, we're praying right now for their salvation. And if that's you, just look toward heaven. Say, Lord Jesus, Son of the living God, I need to be saved. I repent of my sins. Lord, save me today. And the Lord will certainly do that. For if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, the Bible says, thou shalt be saved. We honor you tonight, Lord, and we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. We look forward to any and all of you that can make it out to the revival. Two o'clock this Saturday in the town square in Enfield, North Carolina. And if, what if not? Look forward to seeing you Sunday morning, 11 o'clock a.m. for our Sunday morning service right here at City Refuge Christian Center, Church of God in Christ. Be blessed.